Thank you, uh, Professor Lo. Uh, I think that's a very informative uh, set of findings that you have, uh, you know, published and and you have explained the basis of your findings. Um, and and uh, very quickly, I would like to ask uh, Professor a, a question: uh, Is that how useful uh, uh, would disclosures by companies uh, in in countries where uh, the regime uh, may not be as vigorous uh, or as tough as we have here in Singapore. Uh, the, the first perception I have is that in Singapore, uh, the entire culture, uh, the entire system, the psyche of the nation is hardwired into our system and is in fact institutionalized. So um, how relevant would it be to publish things which uh, obviously are seen as the norms vis-a-vis -vis countries which may not have such a tough, rigorous enforcement regime uh, 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 in comparison to Singapore. I mean, the point is investors, do they look at this and, and ask themselves, look, uh, yes, you have disclosed uh, policies, you have an internal commitment, you have an external commitment, uh, you have a uh, very good comprehensive whistleblowing policy, but um, do we can, can we expect this to be carried out uh, if there are anything that is unethical, anything that is uh, not up to the highest standards of integrity and honesty? Uh, do, we, do we then uh, look at your disclosure per se and mm -hmm. therefore have the faith and confidence in putting our money uh, to buy your securities? Okay, thank, thank you, Robson. I will give an answer that's shorter than your question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I think it's good. First of all, that we, we can look at it from two angles, and I think the, the other panelists, uh, my fellow experts, can uh, chime in as well. I, I think, first of all, we, we have to move away from just say contextualizing things locally. But of course, um, I think many people in this audience are from the Singapore setting, and Singapore, uh, despite some occasional nuances here and there. By and large, our global reputation as a jurisdiction has been very, very high, as high as the Scandinavian countries and as well as New Zealand uh, in particular. So, so having said that, uh, that does not mean that we have to pull back uh, from our information provision. As I said, you know, in my presentation, you know, we, we, we need to actually uh, provide the wealth of, uh, I would say, parameters that would be useful for investors to make certain decisions or don't always take it for granted that investors, including those from overseas, are familiar with the local context, the local expectation, the local, to use your word, Robson, the local psyche. Nobody in the world knows the Singapore psyche. So it is always good to adapt, adopt, to, to, uh, to, to, to be aligned with uh, what some of the international quarters are doing. So, so this, this, all this development by the international organization, Transparency International, uh, of course, the name say is transparency. Transparency is always good. And I would say, even though it is not a sufficient condition for a good investment product. Disclosure would be at the very least a good necessary condition. Okay, thank you. Okay, just a follow-up question, Professor. Is there any risk um, that this uh, disclosures, uh, however exemplary, could amount to some form of window dressing, like what we call a greenwashing, for example, for ESG? So, you know, yes. so the point is that, for example, <clears throat> you mentioned the <clears throat> Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. There's also another um, international benchmark called the uh, PERC, PERC Report on the Annual Review of Corruption in, uh, Asia, in mm -hmm. Asia in particular. They have also looked at countries that were highlighted in your report. Um, and have they not taken into consideration the publications uh, and disclosures of these companies? Uh, in, in coming out with the ranking and, and public perception uh, publication. Uh, it, you know, so, so the point is, what, what value is this to the investor? 
Uh, I, I think you are very, you hit it right in the nail, uh, which is, you know, the, the, that veracity, that the, I would say reliability of the information. And I think it's very natural. I mean, not only in business integrity, in fact, it is not called greenwashing, I call it integrity washing, it's a new word. So uh, people want to present the best. I call product. it window dressing, window, window dressing. dressing. Whatever <laughs> dressing is only natural. In companies, they call it corporate communication. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think it's natural to always put the best front forward. But I think I have to warn uh, against uh, you know misrepresentation, uh, fraudulent, uh, fake uh, information that do not stand up to scrutiny. So I, I believe uh, for this, uh, there will be probably agencies that will help to provide that uh, second order uh, assurance and I think CS can play a good part. Even my research center, mm. uh, you know, we, we, we can actually be beyond just a disclosure, highlight certain nuances, issues in terms of, uh, I'll say, a new window dressing or what are some of the concerns. And I think uh, for many of the aspects, the 13 aspects, naturally there will be some window dressing, but uh, I think we probably need to get back to do a further study on uh, the information but but to, to be very fair to you in when the assessor I think not only by my center international we, we don't just uh, quote something if they say oh we have this practice we, we actually drill down to the specificity don't just say we we have whistleblowing channel full stop then we check the box no 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 we don't do that we look at some of the information, what are the nature, what are the policy, what are the, some of the specific mm -hmm. mechanisms they use. So that there must be validated evidence. But this is as far as we can do uh, to base on some of the self-declared information. The next layer will be, of course, uh, assurance. And I think already in the realm of uh, sustainability, which include governance, uh, the, the assurance space is now getting more mature and companies can actually subject some of this disclosure for third party verification. And it's happening quite a lot now in uh, the governance and even the social aspect of sustainability beyond just the environment. And I think this falls directly in the interface of uh, governance and social. Mm -hmm. And I hope uh, investors will now have to also read between the lines. If certain things are assured, trust the information a bit more. But for those that are just put there, you know, sometimes you will you need to be more, I would say, circumspect. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think uh, SIA's commission, uh, Prof and his team, to do this research. I was also bewildered when I received the report because really it, it seems to run against the uh, international findings on uh, corruption status of countries, uh, Asian intelligence. Corruption perception index and whatnot, whatnot. But as Prop pointed out, and he's the rider is this findings are based entirely on disclosures made by companies <clears throat> and do not indicate the country's overall profile. Because my immediate reaction is hey, Malaysia and uh, Thailand seems to be ahead of Singapore in terms of you know, corruption, in fear of integrity, business integrity. I tell you what, Singapore companies have been put in place in terms of integrity and corruption by our LKY's uh, time. From the time he came in, that was his mission. I'll wipe out corruption. So when you don't have in Singapore companies, this as a topic to worry about, and this as a headache, uh, unlike Indonesia or Malaysia or Thailand, uh, they tend to disclose less because we really don't have this problem, uh, largely looming uh, regularly or daily. Uh, Prof, so, so basically, uh, I reconciled this because I was very puzzled, you know. Well, why is it so? Because next door, we have Najib in jail, you know, locked up, the prime minister of a country. And then we have here, Malaysia is the head of us in business integrity. So it's limited, based on limited uh, research on disclosures, not, it does not take into account the practice of companies. What really happens is something that you have to look beyond. So disclosure versus practice. 
If we really marry these two, then we're going to get a different picture. The, the practice aspect is what we find in the Asian, uh, you know, the intelligence report, corruption perception index, and uh, the, you know, the other one that you, you mentioned, uh, perceptions of corruption is just so we are far ahead. We are right on top in terms of corruption index, right? And, but we are here on disclosures down. So we will catch up. I think we need to push the listed company, uh, you know, guys and investors to ask questions about corruption and how is it in the company? What are the measures taken? I think this is what Prof is saying. We don't have that much in Singapore. And my answer to that is because Singaporeans don't worry about corruption anymore. They know they go to jail, they'll be caught. Enforcement is very strict, unlike Malaysia or other countries. We are walking the line. We are walking the talk and we are doing it well. And people like, uh, you know, Pantai, uh, you know, Dennis will tell you the audit companies and the, the companies have looked at every expenditure, every income. So if you're corrupt, the monies are missing. You're in trouble, right? <laughs> Over to you. Okay. Can, can I perhaps invite... Uh, uh... Pang Tai to comment on uh, what has been discussed so far. I mean, from your experience uh, in uh, looking at group companies that, that have subsidiaries in foreign countries, uh, you know, how, how do you reconcile with uh, what is ostensibly published vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what happens on the ground? Uh, have you seen cases of enforcement that uh, people basically do window dressing in their annual reports? Uh, but actually, it's just a uh, date letter. It's just published, uh, probably for optics, uh, you know, for want of a better word. So what, what is your experience like, Pang Tai? Right. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Robson. So what I'm going to do is uh, just uh, uh, go back to uh, David's point first. Uh, I agree with David in terms of uh, really when you look at Singapore's uh, results, uh, it's, it's a given. And uh, really what uh, needs to be differentiated is the practice. And that's important because uh, sometimes when you look at uh, boilerplate disclosure, it tends to tell you a lot of things. Uh, and uh, David, this is a danger where too much disclosure, sometimes it confuses the reader. Uh, you know, is it, is it what you're practicing or you, know, you say that this is what you ought to have? And I think we need to uh, be uh, quite discerning in uh, looking at some of this. And some of you talk about assurance, which probably is the way to go in terms of looking at the practices. And one argument is, uh, you know, the, uh, when you operate in a very difficult environment, the more you need to say something to, 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 this, uh, to sort of uh, take yourself out from you know, the rest and say that you're better because you have all these policies in place. Now, coming back to uh, Robson's question, um, I think it's very much dependent on the oversight from head office. And, uh, you know, when you have a subsidiary operating in a foreign jurisdiction, uh, do they hold the same values? Do they, uh, you know, look at, you know, the practices in accordance with the corporate culture of the entire group? And to me, that's very important because, uh, the uh, letting loose a subsidiary uh, at some point in time is going to taint you if uh, those practices are poor and they are transgression in those jurisdictions. Because after all, you are still you know, a Singapore management, a Singapore group. So I think the, uh, that's a part that's very important. And, uh, and for good practices, that's what we're seeing in terms of companies where there's a strong oversight and a strong tone from the top. And tone from the top is not just you know, the country CEO, but it is down from the group right to the, uh, you know, the uh, foreign operations. Okay. Thank you, uh, Pang Tai. Dennis, fellow auditor, what are your views? Thanks, uh, Robson and everyone. I actually agree a lot with uh, Pang Tai and also with what uh, David has said. Uh, actually, it's the perception versus the reality, right? And the perception we are given, you know, looking at the reports is that, hey, you know, Singapore is a little bit behind. Uh, the reality, I think, is a little bit different. Uh, uh, if you look at, you know, how we have been, even in Singapore, 
uh, very strong in terms of enforcement, right? I think I think we've been stepping up that up progressively right up to you know uh, COVID and 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 beyond. Uh, boards are aware, right? From my professional dealings, I you know talking to to boards, to to audit committees, and so forth, right? You 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 get a sense that you don't really have to tell them about these risks, right? These risks are already inherently ingrained into their questioning. Right, so when when people go and set up uh, operating subsidiaries or you know even joint ventures as as, as you know you, the commonly is the case, right? They are uniquely aware of those risks of operating in different structures, right? Whether I'm wholly controlling this entity or whether I have in in part control with another partner, local partner, because for whatever reason, I just have to lean on him for the local or the domestic practices. I have to lean on him to know who to go to to talk. Right and how to resolve issues. I, I think they are aware. And we always talk about risk, right? And we talk about risk in different, even different angles, right? You, you talk about risk of doing business in different jurisdictions, right? Uh, and you know there are many surveys about uh, ease of doing business, right? If you flip that around, it's also the risk of doing business and the difficulties of doing business in certain countries. So I think when mm. when 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 bots question that, they say, hey. There are certain jurisdictions which are more challenging, right? We all know this, right? So maybe in the whole, uh, you know, portfolio of companies that that are part of that group, right? Which are in more ju more challenging jurisdictions, you know, with service which are in more structured, you know, with better regulatory regime, and then we look at the different types of business that are in those jurisdictions. Some may be very straightforward business. Some may be very complex business. Some may be in business where you actually inherently have to deal with uh, government agencies. Some may be business where actually it's straightforward is dealing B2C, right? Uh, and, you know, with the different types of business, you have different business profile. And with those business profile, you will then have different way of dealing with the risks, right? Some of the risks are more upfront. Some of the risks are more remote, right? So, so I think bots, I'm starting, I'm happy to hear that a lot of bots already use this risk management approach, which... Uh, you know, has been has, has been in, in, in the limelight since 2012, 2013, almost 10 years ago, right? They're starting to use this, you know, very regularly in their discussions to talk about, okay, what are the risks I accept? These are risks, what are the risks that, you know, I don't know about? And I, in these days, uh, you shouldn't have, you should have very much less of the risks that you don't know about, right? Because everything is so transparent. You should be acknowledging that these risks exist and how you're going to deal with it rather than sweep it under the carpet and say, hey, I don't want to know about it. And that, that kind of question, that kind of response doesn't happen too often, you know, thankfully to say uh, in Singapore. <laughs> okay, thank that, you, that's thank my you, view. Thank you, thank you. Uh, perhaps yeah. when you're talking about risk management, I also think about the issue of internal controls. Perhaps it's appropriate to invite Chicken uh, to have a few words on uh, to share his views on, on what has been discussed so far. Chicken? Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, and thank you to SIS as well for inviting uh, DBS here. Uh, I would say I am a bit more, how you say, understanding of the study that was done. Lah, because I think Prof was very, very careful to say that it is an evaluation of the disclosures. It's not actually an evaluation of the risk. So he actually didn't measure the risk. The idea is basically that the disclosures have some correlation. Uh, to the risk, and that may or may not be true. Lah. I think as we have discovered in ESG disclosures. So let me may, maybe make a few uh, you know, umbrella observations and then see you know, whether there's interest in the panel to take any of these conversations further forward. I think the first thing is when you're talking about standards, you do need consensus around the definition of the standards and exactly what these mean so that everybody can normalize their disclosures. Uh, uh, and make no mistake about it, the practical um, amount of work that has to go into disclosures is very significant. Lah. Again, as we have discovered from ESG. So I think my own view is to try to converge corruption disclosures together with ESG disclosures. I think Prof uh, alluded to that just now. Uh, it is already clear that the ESG disclosures have got uh, quite heavy components around financial crime, uh, anti-bribery, uh, and then other aspects also uh, of, of, uh, of, of financial crime. So I do think that's an opportunity to drive uh, standards convergence. And from doing that, you drive better consensus instead of having different standards or here's one study on corruption, here's one study on ESG disclosures, here's one. I think, I think standards convergence is quite an important topic. Now, having said that, within the 13 items that Prof was talking about just now, I think that there are potentially two debates which are worth talking about. One is 
how many of these questions actually correlate to effective anti-corruption risk management? Yeah. So let me throw up something which I consider a redundancy. For example, question one, question three. Right. So you do have a policy, and then does your leadership endorse the policy? But surely, if you have a policy, it's gone through your board approval, your CEO approval. And so I think there's a bit of a debate there in my mind. Uh, would love again, uh, Prof. You know, maybe I'm being a bit provocative here. So please, by all means, uh, reply to that. And then, for example, question uh, thirteen, which is facilitation payments. That's a really, really, really difficult area to get into. Yeah. For example, if you flew to Malaysia during the pandemic, Malaysia has a way of expediting your PCR test approval. Is that a facilitation payment? Is it not, right? Then there are the immigration fast lanes, uh, and that gets to a very difficult area, and the effort that's required to get around the disclosure on facilitation payments may then be disproportionate to the amount of corruption risk that you're actually trying to manage now, because those payments don't fall into large large uh, uh, quantum types of categories. Um, so I've said a few things around standards convergence. I've introduced a debate around, you know, exactly how do we get to the correct list of questions and which ones are correct and effective in managing uh, anti-corruption risk. Uh, okay, I'll pause here. Again, if any of these are interesting topics, I'll be happy to, I'll be happy to discuss our debate further. So, thank, thank you, Chikin. I think, uh, uh, Professor, maybe you'd like to follow up with uh, what uh, Chikin has asked. I think these are quite relevant uh, uh, issues that he has brought up. Maybe your comment. I think I have also a question from the audience uh, that's uh, directed at you, but perhaps after you have responded to Chikin. Yes, I, I think you are quite right. Uh, there may be certain overlap, for example, whether they have a policy. Yes, that, that definitely uh, it is very good to, to say that by looking at it first, it might even involve leadership endorsement if they put it up. But sometimes uh, having certain, uh, I would say, involvement in business and credit does not amount to a very explicit statement. For example, I, I mean the members audience, including uh, Chicken yourself, you know, you have a sustainable report I mean, of course, before the report is pulled up, it should be approved by senior leadership, uh, management team, and even the board of directors. But why does the Singapore Exchange want a board statement, explicit board statement? I mean, if you apply the same logical argument, uh, it is tantamount to saying, you know, that that board statement is redundant, but it is not. It is actually something even more explicit. So, so I think that, that uh, the Transparency International as an organization probably come from this angle of being specific, being specific to particularly require two of this disclosure. And I, I think that, that definitely that, that, that will help us understand. Maybe I want to allow other members of the panel to also chime in because uh, Chicken brought in many, many good points actually. And I want to hear other views as well. I think what, what it all amounts to, to my mind, is, is disclosure the only metrics we can use? Uh, is there prof, is there beyond uh, disclosure? Can we yep. resort to a source, uh, you know, other resources that says this companies as a whole, or this particular company which I looked at their disclosure, Actually, the practice is different. In fact, yes. they've been charged in court or the officers have been charged in court. We could look at an agency, corruption yeah. agency report in the particular country, jurisdiction, whether it's Australia, Malaysia, or Thailand, or Indonesia. What do they say about generally corporate corruption? Yes. Maybe to, to David, I'll just chime in very quickly. I, I think if you put yourself in the shoes of the bona fide investors, especially retail investors, we have no choice but to rely on many of this information provided company. We are not institutional investors. We don't have direct access, a, a direct conduit to in influence or even engage companies as much as the in you know the, the largest shareholders. So I think you know, as a first step for individual investors, this is a good uh, I would say beginning to understand then after that then once you get an initial understanding then you might start to ask questions then you start to verify and you find sources about other things so without a starting point we can never reach the next step or even the ending point of complete understanding of the stock that you want to invest in yeah Thanks. professor um that's a follow-up question uh, have you done uh, any research or is there any source of information where you can trace the uh, you know the 
kind of uh, reaction from the authorities of each of these jurisdictions that you have highlighted uh, against people who have window dressed their uh, reports and actually they don't really comply uh, with what they are saying. Uh, are there are there findings or or, or um, you know statistics that show that uh, the authorities like what we have here in SGX Reco they monitor things which are disclosed and in the event uh, is found to be false or misleading there are there are follow up cases there are investigations and it, it leads to prosecutions and convictions even yes. uh, are there such reports available for example in uh, the other ASEAN countries that you have highlighted ah. Uh. I think the answer is yes and no. Uh, no first, meaning that if you do a complete tracer study of things that leads to enforcement or regulatory agency, so far to the best of my knowledge, no, nobody has uh, made this bridge. No, no, not because conceptually it's not important, but I read empirically there's just no data. Uh, and I think a lot of people understood uh, sometimes we when uh, we do research, no, not because we don't know such thing happen, but because there's just no data, so we are hampered by the availability of information. Not because there's we are hampered by the lack of knowledge or lack of concepts. Every you know the issues are all very clear to researcher, but it's just sometimes we do not make a connect. But having said that, there's also a yes part. The second part is uh, if you look at many of the study, not so much in terms of regulatory or enforcement agency. Uh, even I myself, I, I do carry out a stream of research that even give uh, positive uh, results, positive relationship demonstration between, say, sustainability policy, sustainable disclosure, and number one, uh, stock market value, number two, brand value. I, I have already published such studies, but I must say again, uh, these are all uh, relationship study with, uh, if you want to go to the causality part, is a little bit more complicated, uh, you know, to, to test for causality. I, I don't want to bore the audience with five minutes of lecture, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at least at the relationship level, based on correlation at large sample, we have found and uh, demonstrated relationship in corporate governance, in sustainability, in terms of the disclosure with market reaction. Uh, this is something that has been done in neighboring countries as well. Uh, emerging countries, advanced countries, the, the stream of research has been quite mature already. Yeah, in fact, I think there's some one observation from the audience that basically, um, you know, issues of corruption and unethical business behavior is not just, uh, you know, centered on uh, third world countries or ASEAN in particular. For example, I think today was reported Glencore. They, they are now facing a floodgate of litigations in Britain. Uh, they're in the mining business, so they, they have uh, things which they uh, did not withstand, were not uh, able to withstand to scrutiny for more than 10 years. Uh, so it's not just confined to uh, third world countries, I think it happens also everywhere. And, and uh, there are activities, for example, that uh, people call it lobby, you know, as what, what Chikin says, you know, sometimes you just need to expedite things. But, <clears throat> um, you know, how, how do you classify such uh, a kind of activities and and do you uh, and associate that with unethical business behavior? So perhaps this these are things I I like to invite the auditors to jump in. Pantai, you know when yes. when you see expenses, for example, you know in in the group companies that you audit, uh, and 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 for example they they are not able to produce a very clear documentary trail and 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 evidence as to the nature of these expenses. So how, how do you uh, how do you uh, take a position whether uh, the accounts re represent a true and fair view of that particular foreign subsidiary? Right. Well, I, I, I will answer that question and I go back to something that Chi Jin raised. Uh, well, typically when you, say, when you see some of these transactions, uh, you rightly pointed out, not supportable. Uh, commission paid to somebody that, you know, they don't look <laughs> familiar and uh, there's no correlation to their business. And it's, uh, those are all the red flags. And this is where you know, uh, we will be uh, drilling down and asking uh, questions, you know, what the nature of these payments really are and whether those uh, charged with governance are familiar and they have asked those questions. And these tend to be uh, you know, payments that are large amount, typically you, you know, when it's flagged out. And of course, you know, when you think about facilitation fee, you can happen you know, on the ground 
uh, as, uh, as simple as, you know, at the airport, the immigration officer, and that just, you know, uh, tens of dollars, you know, which will not catch your attention. And this is coming back to an important point where we talk about integrity. And integrity is a product of human beings. And the processes, the values, and all the, 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 the disclosure we are putting out is trying to manage uh, you know, and uh, the human behavior. And, uh, and this is a question maybe for Prof as well, where you know, I was reading this uh, global business ethics survey, and it's quite interesting because uh, the global median uh, has shot up from 2015, uh, and the latest number I have is 2020, I know 2021 has been released. Uh, you know, it went up from 22% to 29%. So when human beings face pressure, and the question is, what's the motivation that would drive them into doing something? Uh, and the, the three sources of pressure is coming up really uh, meeting uh, performance goals. That's one, uh, you know, always being available. That's throwing up because of work from home, because this is 2020, and the ability to show value. And this is all driving in terms of many of the things that, you know, could be happening. And the question is, at the organizational level, what do we do you know, in terms of, uh, apart from having processes, the rules, and the question is whether uh, our people understand those rules. And this is where, when you start thinking about uh, fraud, you know, ethical conduct or unethical conduct, you know, where it is white and it's black is very clear. But when it falls within the gray zone, and that's the difficult part, how do you get everyone to be on the same page? You know, is paying $20 to an immigration officer so that you get onto a shorter queue, a faster queue? You know, is that, you know, the conduct that's acceptable to the organization or not? And I think it is uh, the onus of everyone and especially uh, the organization leadership team to make sure that all people understand, you know, what, you know, what should be white, what should be uh, black so that we reduce the gray zone. And that's where, you know, the awareness and uh, many of these will kick in. So uh, yeah. I'll leave it like that. And uh, maybe for the other panel members to jump in, I know Chicken is out. <laughs> well, uh, well, before Chicken, I'll ask Dennis. Dennis, uh, you know, does it boil down to the issue of materiality? Something that is, uh, for example, $1,000 may look uh, alarming, but in the context of a company that is multi-million dollar turnover, vis-a-vis -vis if suddenly there's an inexplicable expense of uh, $3 million, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's used to facilitate uh, the purchase of a house of someone else who is influential in getting the contract signed or sealed. Mm -hmm. So how, how, do you, how, how do you address this as an auditor? Do you qualify? Uh, do you disclaim? Uh, you know, so what are your views? I think it's a question of, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, there's no one clear-cut answer. La. I think materiality is, of course, important, right? And, you know, uh, 50,000 to one company is very different to another, right? Of course, right? So, but the question is, is again, I mean, that, that impact of that 50,000, right? Does that 50,000 entail a straight, out, you know, a contravention of rules or laws, uh, uh, is it a criminal offense? That kind of a thing, of course, has to come into question. Uh. So it's, it's beyond just the, the monetary amount. Uh, in fact, I was just reflecting on what uh, 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 Prof and uh, uh, Bangtai also mentioned. I think black and white is is an uh, interesting concept, of course. In those earlier days, it was grey. I still remember years ago when I had to go to Indonesia. And when I get to Indonesia, they asked me to register at a police station. Right, in those days, uh, I, I just these are all things that are flashing back in my mind. Maybe when it comes back, uh, you know, things things that may seem very unusual back then now are very normal, right? And or in fact, we don't even do that because uh, we've gone into digital, right? I read somewhere that uh, there's also transformation. Not only Singapore government doing transformation. I think regionally they are all doing this digitalization, administrative transformation. That reduces that uh, that obviously the potential for people to take, you know, to have to ask for something in order to expedite something. I think you, if you flush those things through the system, right? Uh, you know, some may argue it, it, it will reduce that risk, that corruption risk. Some will say that, you know, things can still happen, 
right? Uh, uh, you know, it's hard to it's hard to know which side of the fence to sit on. But I think with digitalization, certain things can actually reduce. Uh, which digitalization is important because it relates to the concept of data, right? Because if you don't have data, how to digitalize? So there was earlier on a, a panel member who actually mentioned, I don't have the data, right? You, if you don't have the data, you can't make sense of where the situation uh, really is. And actually, in fact, actually when, when, when companies are concerned uh, and they look at, uh, you know, the data, right? Or rather the lack of data, that is the, the, the fear. You know, I, I, took, I think, talked to a, a couple of, uh, you know, business owners and they say to me, it's actually, we know the risk. Right, uh, we know what we're getting into, right? And we recognize, right, that there are certain things that you know uh, you can use different means of of managing structures to manage arrangements to manage so on and so forth. And those are things that we know how much we are paying, right? It's not the it's not the fifty dollars or the hundred dollars, right? Or, or how many uh, the list of items you are talking about there. What we really fear, what those people really fear, are the things that are off the books, right? The kickbacks. Right, uh, the under the table. So those are the things that actually, at the end of the day, is the fear of the unknown, right? So, so the tone on the top is important, right? It's not to say that you know everybody goes around and openly says, "I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna pay whatever needs to be paid to to get the business done." It's not about that. It's about hey, where's the position that we stand, right? Okay, uh, if, uh, uh, and and I think on digitalization also, if we say B, we go B to C, and you know, uh, Singapore companies are all. Or, you know, regionally, they are also going into digital. They are going into e-commerce, right? That has its own separate set of problems when it comes to operating in, in overseas jurisdictions. But if you capture the data, you capture the information properly and you, you structure the transactions properly, you will definitely see more a lot more transparency and a lot less risk of leakage. Yeah, thank you, uh, yeah. Dennis, uh, because we're running out of time. So Chicken, just a quick question. Uh, as a bank, when you uh, lend to a potential customer or you onboard a customer, do you look at uh, the jurisdiction that the client comes from, for example, you know, in the area of wealth management? And we know that a lot of foreigners are coming to Singapore. Uh, so uh, what, what are the things that you can share with us uh, from an internal controls perspective, from a KYC perspective? Uh, within the bank's uh, disclosable uh, you know, uh, area that you can share with us? Yeah, great question. And so I don't think this would be limited to uh, DBS alone. La. Actually, yes, of course. all standards in banking, especially in this area, tend to be driven by international standards. Uh, and maybe one subtlety which may be lost, uh, the bulk of international trade is still denominated in the US dollar, which means a US dollar payment will go through the banking system and will find its way into some type of a nostril bostral entry in New York, uh, which would establish jurisdiction for the US authorities. Yeah? So I think that there's an inevitable leveling up aspect to anti-corruption. Uh, same is true for euros, it will go through the euro system. Same is true for renminbi, it will find its way through the renminbi uh, clearance system. Yeah? Um, so I think there's this inevitable characteristic about the nature of payments clearing uh, that causes this leveling up to take place, which means everybody's got to hit to international standards anyway. Okay. Now within banking, uh, we are obliged uh, to perform what are called know your customer checks. And one of the factors that typically goes into a know your customer check is the country risk. That's an extremely blunt instrument, yeah, because you're basically saying that you're 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 passing a judgment on the entire population of a country, good or bad, merely by reason of the country of origin of that person. So I think it's a very, very blunt instrument. Uh, more subtly, we have another control called the source of wealth control. Uh, which typically examines exactly how this client made their money and is that source of wealth uh, legitimate or illegitimate. And the banks have all got pretty robust processes around this because we're all regulated to high standards uh, for this. So that would be the way by which we would um, typically uh, evaluate a customer at onboarding. And I think to the point that you just made, uh, so if there's an incident during the lifetime of that customer with a bank where, let's say, they are investigated or worse, that they are charged or they are convicted 
or they have to sign a settlement agreement with authorities anywhere in the world, that would trigger a review of what is called their KYC profile. And that will then also mean that, you know, the bank may be asking further questions around this stuff, all for the sake of uh, making sure that we are aligned with international standards on anti-money laundering or financial crime. Thank you, Chicken. One last question for Professor, the, the very persistent question that uh, someone from the audience, he says, <clears throat> Professor, could you suggest how our corporate disclosure uh, governance code and, and uh, uh, disclosure policies can be improved so that we are more aligned uh, with what our neighbours are doing so that at the end of the day, the spirit of good governance, uh, uh, in, in spirit of good disclosure of true and fair uh, disclosures uh, can be more robustly practiced here. So maybe you can uh, offer some suggestion. That comes from an uh, audience, uh, a member, I think he's a lawyer, uh, Adrian Chan. So uh, <laughs> I think so. But you know, could, could, you, could you take this question? And I think uh, we will then end on, on your note. Okay, I, I, I think that definitely uh, Adrian, I know him. We can actually have coffee and talk uh, until... <laughs> Share with us, no, not, not but, but giving coffee. I think, <laughs> you, you see, uh, uh, from a regulatory or even from a market perspective, I, I think we, we need to calibrate a certain sense of uh, purposeful balance. Uh, of course, from an investor viewpoint, as much information, you know, adequate, accurate information is good, but you, you must also see from the view of the information preparer, the, the reporter, that the company, uh, I, I know uh, Jikin will definitely testify to it. There's a lot of reporting disclosure fatigue going on in all the functions in company. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, you spend 80% of the time disclosing and 20% of your time doing. I mean, <laughs> so I think we, we, we need to address a certain balance. And I think broadly, what is more important is, you know, looking at the big picture, looking at the reputation of the company that's more important, more, more than just, you know, piecemeal specific uh, uh, incidental. Professor, you have 30 seconds to sum yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think it's just like good. I think this disclosure is good, but, but we need to put it in the proper perspective, just like, you know, a Zoom meeting. You know, sometimes you turn on the video, you disclose yourself, it's good. And like David, you know, he even show his office, you know, all of us understand where he's coming from, where he's sitting. And I think that that helps to create confidence. So, so I always for disclosure, but do it meaningfully, do it accurately and do it purposefully. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Thank you to all uh, panelists. We have come to the end of the panel discussion.